Hello, welcome to Stephen Speak, episode number 13, um, I think it is. I'm recording this in advance, and that's what my spreadsheet says. Ooh, spreadsheet, somewhat organised. Um, as you see from the title of the show today, it's uh, called The Irish Connection. So, um, I'm half Irish, and I'm going to talk about what it's like to visit relatives and visit Ireland. Northern Ireland, that is. Um, so yeah, let's speak about that. Welcome to Stephen Speak the Podcast. Unscripted prattle on everything and nothing. Ah, uh, hello, welcome, 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 welcome. Um, I can't do an Irish accent, so I'm not even gonna try. Um if my brother was here, he can do the best Belfast accent and the best Shankle accent ever. Um Anyway, so the Irish connection. This this episode today is just about. Um, I'm half Irish. I have an Irish passport. I applied for one a couple of years ago because I thought, you know what, I have the right to. Why the hell not? You know, we're not in Europe anywhere in Britain uh, anymore in Britain, and I thought, you know, might be nice to have that that passport from there that kind of envelops Europe as well as maybe having a, may renew my British one as well. Um, feel like James Bond and have two passports. Um, but yeah, my mum's from Northern Ireland, originally from Belfast in, in Northern Ireland, um, which is in the UK, uh, currently, uh, whether that'll change in the future, I don't know, but, uh, the North-South divide is, is an issue. I'm not really going to get too much into that today because that's, that's a separate issue and I don't want to get political in this program, but we all know about the troubles in Northern Ireland, um, I think. Uh, if you don't, where have you been? Living under a rock? Uh, just just Google it quickly, you know, try and use a, a sensible source of information if you can uh, that gives you some facts rather than uh, opinion. Um, my my general opinion is don't kill each other, basically. You know, there's there's better ways to, to resolve things. Um, but I've been going to... My mum's Irish and I've been going to Northern Ireland since I was born because um, her whole family were there and still are. She's now there again. Um, so she met my dad. My dad was ser- a serving paratrooper in the army uh, in the seventies, and my mum met my dad while he was serving. Uh, it was a whirlwind romance. They fell in love, and I think they actually met when my mum was trying to cause some trouble. I think I, th- I feel like she was up to no good, and my dad bumped into her and basically told her to bugger off home. But then my Aunt Sally's house was the place where she she was a Protestant and she was she would welcome the troops into the house and give them tea and biscuits and such things, and that was my um, mum's auntie. She wasn't technically my auntie, um, so yeah, so that that was a a nice a nice thing that she used to do for the troops. Um, obviously, there's the Catholic and the Protestant thing. That's what the whole troubles are about. Uh, my family over there are Protestants. Not that, that matters, but. It, in context of the story, it kind of does. And then, obviously, my dad met my mom, and they went on dates, and before you know it, you know, uh, swept up in the romance of of, uh, of everything. And uh, my mum moved to England, basically, uh, into the married quarters in uh, Aldershot with my dad. And the rest, as they say, is history. You know, they, they ended up getting together and getting married and having myself and my brother. Uh, my brother's older than me, so they had him first, uh, obviously. I don't have to explain that. Um... <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, they got they got divorced in two thousand and four. Well, they they separated in two thousand and four, and my mum, um, probably out of the upsetness uh, upsetness that's not a word. Probably out of the upset of the divorce, uh, decided to move back to Ireland, um, which was probably a good thing for her in some ways. But obviously, she's uh, away from myself and my brother. Uh, but it means that me and my wife have got somewhere to go on holiday now. <laughs> Silver linings and all, you know. Um, but yeah, so we, we I've been going there since I was born, obviously, because my mum's obviously my mum lived over here, um, and all her family were there. So we we'd go over there multiple times a year. It's like a second home for me, uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, it's such a wonderful place. I I would actually move there, uh, if if I could, if I knew I could get a job or if I had a way of like you know working from there, I would definitely move there. When you know. Tomorrow, if I could. Like, it's just such a lovely place. Uh, if you've never been to Ireland, north or south, go. It's a beautiful place. Uh, the people are so friendly. Um, 
And as long as you don't kind of mention the troubles or go in certain parts, it's like anywhere, you know, you can go, you can go any country and go in the wrong area. But as long as you go there and you, you know, you act sensible and you are a tourist, like you're never going to get any trouble. You know, you're not going to have any uh, issues. I've, I've been going there. I'm 39, so I've been going there for 39 years, and I've only had two times when I had questions asked of me, let's say. Um, and ironically, it was the only time that my mum's warned me about something. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to that if I remember and, uh, and tell you about that separately. Um, but yeah, I've been going there since I was born. Um, my granddad, my mum's dad, uh, lived in Belfast still. And my auntie lived with him. She uh, never moved out of home and she stayed there. She had a daughter uh, and that we used to go visit them. Uh, my mum's mum unfortunately passed away, you know, when she was when she was a kid. So I never got to met her, meet meet her. Ever. I was having trouble with my worst day, so I never got to meet my my grandmother. Um, but from all accounts, I believe she was very much like my mum uh, in the way she was. So uh, I think I can kind of surmise the kind of person she was. Um, but yeah, we'd we'd go there like two, three, four, five times a year whenever we could. When we had free passes, my dad worked on the railway, so we had free passes have to really pay for the ferry you only had to pay port tax at the time so you could walk on and just say i want to pay port tax and uh, it was literally the tax on a ticket so say the ticket was like i don't know like a tenner and vat was like 20 percent. you just paid whatever the 20 percent on that um and pound was so and what would that be two quid like that's nothing is it really uh i don't even think it was that much at the time i think the fares on the ferry were, were a lot lower than they are now well they were a lot lower than they are now Bloody ridiculous! We've just booked to go away. We actually booked to go away. When this actually goes out, the reason I'm, I'm actually recording it the same day I'm recording episode number eleven. Spoiler. Um, so that's why I had to double check my spreadsheet to see if it was actually. So when this actually goes out, I will be in Ireland uh, visiting my mum uh, for a week and a bit. Uh, and the ferry was expensive this time, uh, but I love going on the ferry. It's part of the experience for me. Like we used to go up on the sleeper train as well uh, sometimes. So we'd get it, get it from crew, and it used to leave crew about midnight, and it used to get, go up to Glasgow and splits, and then part of it go to Stranra. Um, I really want to do the PTK Stranra thing. Stranra! Um, <laughs> I did it. So there you go. And um, you'd get to the you'd get to the the the, the ferry port like a bit before the ferry was going to leave, and you just walk off as a foot passenger straight into the ferry, and then you'd get to Belfast at like early early morning. Uh, it took about three or four hours on the ferry, maybe a bit longer because they were the old, old conventional ferries at the time. And uh, yeah, so it was it was a long journey, but I used to love it. It was such an adventure when you were a kid to go on a sleeper train and 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 travel through the night. And you know, you never get to stay up that late when you're a kid. Um, or conversely, we we would sometimes drive. And my dad was there. We would sometimes opt to take the car with us. So it was that was the only thing when we went without my dad. We were, we were restricted. We have to use public transport. So we were only able to go places where we could go public transport um, or when one of my cousins could give us a lift somewhere, etc. But when my dad was available, it was like a family holiday. We'd go over there for like summer holidays. Um, my granddad had a caravan and we used to we used to go there and stay. And um, yeah, just, just lovely, lovely memories. Uh, I love my grand, granddad to pieces. He was one of the, the best people. Um so knowledgeable i have really affectionate memories of him just sitting for hours playing cards we used to, it's literally as soon as we'd walk through the door like we'd be like grandma get your pack of cards out we'll play gym rummy and stuff like that and uh and and he used to be mildly to play gym rummy all the time it was it was crazy and he had quite bad arthritis in his hands and uh he would just play for hours with us despite the pain in his hands eventually he'd have to say like i've got to stop lads like um but yeah, but he'd sit and play for ages with us. Uh, he was such an intelligent guy as well. He was uh, he was so well versed in in books. He used to love like a, a military story or a spy story or you know anything with a twist. Like Ag- Ag- Agatha Ag- Agatha Christie novels, he used to love uh, and big band uh, music and model railways and. Uh, yeah, it was. He, he was just such a clever guy. He was like an encyclopedia, and I always looked up to him because he he just seemed to know things, and that's how I aspire to be, like just a little random book of knowledge, uh, and just be be well read. And I don't think I've attained his level of excellence yet. Um, 
And that's, that's the main person I used to love going to see, along with my Aunt Sally. And both, both of them, sadly, are no longer with us. But we used to go to Sally's house, and that's the person that used to let the troops into our house and feed them tea and cake. And Sally was... Uh, Irish hospitality is second to none. This is this is kind of where I'm going with this. Like, even when we used to arrive at my granddad's and auntie's house, like, we could have just eaten. They would put a plethora of food down. Um, cakes, fresh toast, the best butter, you know, only the best butter in Ireland. Uh, big, massive pot of tea, you know, no coffee in sight. Um, just delicious. But my Aunt Sally, she was she was on a bit of another level, to be fair. She was... She was a feeder. She was a feeder. And I remember it was actually when I was training for, like, I was trying to just get fit, basically. So a couple of episodes, like, a couple of episodes, you know, you'll, you'll hear of me, like, saying when I was trying to get fit and stuff for joining the army. And I was trying to do that at the time. I think I was, I think I was still at school. Maybe, maybe I was at college, but I'd lost a load of weight. And it's probably a shock to her. She hadn't seen me in a while. And, and she was like, oh, my God, like, you've lost loads of weight. Oh, are you feeding him, Elizabeth, and all this so to me, Mum? Mum was like, yeah, he's just working out and stuff. And she was like, right, we need to get you fed. And I'd literally just eaten in the town. Like, me and my mum had had lunch in Belfast. So we, we'd had, like, a little sandwich and a little cake um, and a little coffee shop that I absolutely adored. It's not even, I don't think, well, it, I think it is there, but it's been taken over and it's shite now. But the, there was this little coffee shop, and I can't remember what it was called, but in the middle of Belfast there's a bandstand. And opposite where they've built the Victoria Shopping Centre, there's, there's a right turn and... There was a little coffee shop on the right hand side, and it used to have like um, scallop shells for like ashtrays because it was the times when you could smoke in them. And it was like this little cafe, and it was a bit dingy and a bit dark, but they did the best food like Ulster fries, an Ulster fries, like an English breakfast with potato bread and soda bread and white pudding. Um, the best, the best breakfast you can have in the world, uh, bar none. And they used to do the the freshest sandwiches and and the nicest little cakes. It was the best place. And I loved it in there. And if I went in town with my granddad, that's where we'd always go. That was his little haunt. And if I went to Ireland on my own, that's where I'd go for lunch. I never went anywhere else in Belfast. I was restricting myself quite a lot because there's so many nice places in Belfast, which I'm discovering now that place has gone shite. Um but yeah, that was the place and I used to I used to go and, and eat there all the time. And uh but we'd we'd had something in there basically. I'd lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> I was just thinking about that place and how upset I am it's shut. Uh, so yeah, we'd eaten we'd eaten there, and my aunt Sally was like, "Oh, I'll put I'll I'll make some sandwiches." And she was like, "No, seriously, don't. Like we're we're not we're not hungry." And she was like, "Oh, don't don't say that. Look at you. There's nothing of you." And she said she was going to put a wee a wee bite together, and I knew what that meant. My mum knew what that meant. And she came back with, she was in the kitchen for about 25 minutes. And mum went and we went and had a chat with her while she was doing it, trying to convince her not to make as much food. And then she shooed us out of the kitchen to speak to um, my mum's cousin. And um, who lived who lived with my aunt, aunt Sally uh, and her daughter. So we were chatting away. And Sally, it was when she was able to do this, because unfortunately, obviously the older you get, she, she lost the ability. So she'd order people around to do this for her when she got a bit older. Um, which came through with like I think it was like two trays of sandwiches, a full tray of like um, buns and and cakes and a pot of tea, and it it was just a bit balmy really. Um, and she insisted literally that I had at least two or three like quarters of sandwiches. I probably had like another two sandwiches to be honest. And it was it was it was a bit. I don't I don't resent it because like all the food was absolutely delicious. But you're just kind of thinking, I don't, I don't need any of this. I'm absolutely rammed. Um, but it was, it was amazing. Um, that to get that hospitality from it every single time, and she'd always give me fifty p and say, "Oh, there's fifty p for your love." And no matter what age I was, it was always fifty p or a pound. And uh, I just loved it a bit. She was, she was just such a lovely woman, uh, very religious. Uh, and uh, but yeah, but the, the the amount of food she used to bring out was was a bit ridiculous, really. Even though even though she'd known known we just eaten, and I remember we went on from there to my uncle Bobby and Aunt Jean's house. Unfortunately, they're both not with us. This is depressing, isn't it? And uh, we both went to their house afterwards. So bearing in mind we'd had, um, I nearly got the name of that place, and it went straight away. Uh, that that little place in Belfast. We'd been the place in Belfast to have some lunch, and we'd had second lunch. We're like hobbits. We had a second lunch and cake and about three cups of tea. So we literally, probably within the hour of eating that second Hobbit lunch, we went around to my Aunt Jean and Bobby's. 
and this was probably only about half one, two o'clock now, and uh, maybe a little bit late, and they were having like an afternoon brunch, and Jean had made a, an Ulster fry, and we walked in, and again, the Irish hospitality is, they didn't have, they, they, she, she was like, oh, make you some extras, and we were like, no, we're just eating, she's like, I've not really got a lot, she, she did a few bits of extras, but she basically split her and Bobby's meal up, so we could all have a little bit of an Ulster fry, and we were like, seriously, don't, I'm fucking stuffed, just had two, she was like, oh, no, you can't come here. Bobby was furious because he didn't like sharing food. He was literally like, he said to me, "Mum, she's fat enough; she doesn't need anything." He was, he was, he was, he could be vile, but he, it was all in jest a lot of the time. But you know, jest can hurt, can't it? Because it was all kind of based on reality. Because my mum is a little bit was a little bit tubby as well, so um, I'd lost loads of weight. And he was like, "He'll eat everything," because he he was surprised at how much weight I'd lost. And um, but she did. She, she was like, "Oh, don't be, don't be horrible." Like you know, we got to feed our guests and all this. So we were forced to eat a mini Ulster fry, and I'm kind of glad that she didn't do a full one because I think I would have been sick. But I just remember going back to my granddad's house, I like, absolutely stuffed. And then we'd only got there, and my aunt Margaret, because it was like it's like a thing in Ireland. You have a brew, you have to have something with it. They always bring like bits of cake out, mainly Paris buns to be honest. I and I used to love Paris buns. Um. It's something we don't get in England, and I'm I'm kind of glad in a way because I would be super fat if they were available, and they're like a like a, like a kind of like a rock cake, but they're topped with like massive is it called pearl sugars like like clumped sugar, uh, and you can get them you can get them dipped in um, chocolate and everything, um, but they're quite dry and they go perfectly with like Sarah doesn't really like them, but I, I I'm literally my mouth's filling with saliva thinking about them. But they, uh, they're really, really dry, but they're just the best thing to have with the brew, because you bite a bit, sippy brew, oh my god, when I go to Ireland, Paris buns are on the menu. Um, yeah, but we got about to be auntie in my granddad's house, and, oh, I've made you a brew, blah, because my mum would, like, like, maybe phoned or, or something, and or we'd agreed a time we'd be home for, and she just made a brew, so she, she brought cakes out, and then moaned we weren't eating them, so I had to eat, I had to eat a Paris bun. Never felt so ill in my life. Bear in mind, this is like four, maybe half three, four o'clock, maybe at this time. And then she puts the tea on, like five, and I'm like, "What are we having? Like, I I can't face any more food." Um, but it's all done with such love over there. Like, um, and I've got so many fond memories of just visiting people's houses and just the kids were always involved. That you know, it's it's very different to England. I feel like it. They're they're so family orientated. Uh, everyone goes around everyone's house. Everyone takes turns to her, like do the Sunday dinner, or if it's always at someone's house, everyone walks in. Everyone brings their own little piece. The kids are never excluded from conversations. Like it's never like, oh, like we'll go and give the kids a football outside so they piss off, so we can, so the adults can talk. The kids are just there um, and mingling and and on a level with the adults uh, to a degree, obviously. Um, so I've got so many amazing memories of, of, of holidays there and the caravan park and and summer romances and my, I remember my brother had a, like a summer romance with a girl from the caravan park and it went on for a few years every time I went back it, he'd write to her and speak to her on the phone and stuff and it was kind of cute she was called Sarah Jane I remember um, and she was pretty to be fair she was like long blonde hair really pretty girl and I always remember thinking to myself why did she fancy my brother that's really weird um, and she had a, she had a sister called Oh, God, what was her sister called? She had a bit of a straight... I'm sure, I wanted to say Haley, but it wasn't. It was something like that, I'm sure. Little, and I kind of fancied her a little bit, but she was a bit too old for me, really. Because um, Gavin's like five years older than me, and I think her sister was only like a year younger than her, so or a year and a half, so she was still like two and a half, three years older than me. So, yeah. Um, oh, God, her name's going to really annoy me. Anyway, I wonder where they are now. Married of Married with kids, no doubt. Um, yeah, it was. It's, it's just. It's just the best place, and it's just um, family love. That's all it is. It's love. That's that's all it is, and they they feed you with love as well. Like literally feed you. Um, but I've got I've got quite a few relatives there. A lot of cousins. Uh, over the last few years, we've lost quite a lot of people. Uh, and my granddad passed away. It was about ten. Kind of twelve years ago, maybe thirteen years ago, actually. I think it was twenty ten. Uh, yeah, it was twenty ten. So quite quite a long time ago. Um, over the last like five years, I've lost 
a couple of aunties, um, or three aunties and cousin. So there's there's a lot of people um, aren't there anymore, and it's so sad. And and my aunt Jean and aunt Bobby, they they're gone, and um, it's just the thing with getting older, isn't it? You know, like they they were they were older people when I was a kid, and uh, it's like twenty thirty years later. Um, I have such good memories, as I said. Like all their memories can't be taken away from me. But I have so many, so many relatives over there, and the, and the new generation. Because uh, my auntie, uh, my aunt Barbara, she she was just the most amazing. Like big, massive hugs every time we went over. Um, always asked how you doing. Like again, always fed you. She she was Sally's daughter, so she definitely got that Sally trait of like you go to her house and she'd put like about four million things out on a, on a plate. Uh, ama- like just a just a beautiful, amazing woman, and she she had a load of showed a load of kids, um, all boys, and they've all got kids pretty much. I think there's only one that hasn't got a kid, uh, but they've all got multiple kids. Um, so I still have loads of people over there that are connect- like a very strong connection, and um, love them all to pieces. And uh, I wish I could see them more often, but it's it's just difficult, with, you know, life and especially with COVID. It was it was a bit of a killer because. Um, with Sarah's illness, we couldn't visit, and my mum got cancer that year, and it was it was very distressful, distressful, distressing. I'm mixing words up today. Uh, it was very distressing because you know, on top of the the stress of work, uh, you had the stress of obviously um, the whole pandemic, COVID thing, and then my mum isn't very well, and I couldn't travel, and um. It, there was just the worry that, that my my worry about traveling was because Sarah's quite open for me traveling. I could have traveled because you can use like that kind of as a reason. You could have used that as a reason, but my worry about traveling was basically is getting there and not, not then going in, them going into a lockdown and not being able to get back and then having to work from Ireland and then not being able to look after Sarah in case she needed it because she'd have been on her own and what if she got ill then I'd be stuck in Ireland and would I be able to get back? Would that be then an exe- exemption to get back again? Um, so there was a lot of these things, and I remember we had to cancel like three trips to Ireland. We we booked it, and they did a lockdown. Uh, it was like it was like it was like when they looked like it was all gonna be okay again, and we bought something, and li- literally a week later they announced another lockdown, so we had to cancel that, move it, and then they 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 did it again, and I don't think I saw my mum probably for ne- like nearly two years, um, and that was that was tough, and not only that, just not being in Ireland for two years. Excuse me. It sounds really it's it sounds really ridiculous. But um that's my home. That's like I've been going there that long that it is a home. But the smell of the place, the feel of the place, just people being nice to you in shops, like it's a whole different place. Like if you've never been, please go. Uh it it's not got the stigma that people think it has. Uh it, again, it's like anywhere. It's a big city. You know, there are it's, they do still have some internal problems with the with the troubles, um. But it's very much touristy. There's been so much more money invested into it over the last like ten, fifteen years, uh, and it's a, just a pleasure to to go like Dublin or or Belfast or or anywhere in Ireland really. Um, but you'll see a difference in the people. Like they're so friendly. Um, they'll chat to you in shops in queues. And it's a bit, it takes you back a bit because you're so used to standing in the queue in this country. And fair enough, it'll happen sometimes, but generally, like, everyone's like in their own world and they don't really want to engage. Whereas in Ireland, they're just, they're, that's the, it's like the opposite. Like, if you get someone that doesn't want to engage, they're the, they're the lepers kind of thing. Uh, and I was going to say, coming back to it, I've only ever had like two, two problems in, in Ireland. And once was, um, again, when I was training for the army, <laughs> harking back to that. And I was going over to Ireland, and I, I was I'd bulked up, and I looked pretty good, and I'd shaved my head. I I I think I was, I think I was finishing the. It was either just before I went on the signalling course, or I was just finishing the signallers course, and I decided to go to Ireland on my own, see my granddad and my auntie, and um, my mum said to me, she goes, "Be careful when you're over there on your own." And I was like, "Oh God, I've been there before on my own. Like, what are you on about?" And she's like, "No, seriously, because you look like a soldier." Which I took as a massive compliment, having wanted to join the army, you know. And I was like, really? And I said, yeah, no one's going to think that. And she was like, no, honestly, you do. And I was like, well, and my dad went, to be fair, Steve, you you, you, you do look like, because you, you've shaved your head, you look like, yeah, you kind of do. And I was like, oh. And I, I, all I thought, I was like, well, don't, no one's going to say anything in Ireland to me, because that's ridiculous, because it's never happened before. And I, I was quite happy to look like a soldier. 
And um, like, and I've never never had any ones like that. My mum said, said, just watch who you talk to, and blah, blah, blah. But never massive kind of like warnings or anything about visiting there or going out on my own. And it was really weird because even before I'd got to Ireland, I got asked the question, am I, am I a soldier? And what had happened was the train had got cancelled at Glasgow and they were putting taxis on Stranraer. And um, I must have still been working for Virgin because I had my Virgin pass. Uh, so it must have been before starting signalling school. That must have been it. And um, they decided to put me in a taxi. But because I, I was staff, I wasn't entitled to one. But someone else turned up and they went, right, you can jump in with them, but just don't tell anyone we did this for you kind of thing. And I was like, well, they're going anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I'm telling everyone now, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, but the taxi driver was like, oh, you're going over there to serve, are you? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And he was like... I thought he meant like a chef or something. And he was like, oh, you're squatty. And I was like, no, I'm not a squatty, mate. I said, my, my family live there. And he was like, oh, you're like a soldier. And I was like, again, I was like, yeah, I look like a soldier, do I? Brilliant. Uh, but then I was thinking, Jesus, my mum was right. And then I was in a, I was in Woolworths, of all places, buying a pick and mix. And there was this big skinhead guy, uh, red hand of Ulster tattooed, like about three times on his arms. And uh, he turns to me, turns to me in the in the queue, and he goes... Who are you? Like in the proper staunch, strong Shankle accent. And I'm like, what's it to you kind of thing? Like people like that don't intimidate me. I've never really been intimidated by stuff like that. Um, And he was like, you Catholic or a Protestant? And I was like, what are you on about? I was like, neither. And uh, he was like, you a soldier? And I was like, no, mate. I said, my family live here. I said, I'm visiting family. And uh, I said, I can see you're a Protestant. He was like, how do you know that? So you got a red hand tattooed all over you. And I think he was going to back off at that point because I think he thought, oh, well, you know, he's obviously a Protestant kind of thing, even though he's like not answered that question. And then this woman in front of him she turned around and like, kind of smacked him and went, oh, you leave him alone kind of thing. Like, what are you doing kind of thing? And um, I didn't tell my mum that at the time. I told her, I think I told her when I got back from Ireland that had happened because she'd have been terribly worried about me. Um, I just thought, I thought, oh, fucking hell, it's never happened before. And they mentioned it and it's happened twice now. I've been called out as being a squaddy. And the only other time it happened was I was in the pub at my mum's local when she first moved back over there. And she sent me to the bar for a drink. And I got to the bar and this guy just turned around. And he, was, he lived in the village as well. And he, he just was poking me going, what do you think about what do you think about Ireland? What do you think about this? What do you think about the troubles? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, and in the end, I just turned around and said, what's, what's your fucking problem? And he was like, well, you know, you being English and that. And I was like, what's that got to do with anything? And I said, you know what? I said, I think you're all fucking idiots. And that's what I said to him. Uh, I said, you know, shooting each other. I said, just fucking live in peace, you know. Like, what, what does a border matter? You can both travel across it free. doesn't really matter, does it? I was like, just leave me alone. And um, it shut him up. I mean, I just said that off the cuff just to basically react to him, really. I probably shouldn't have said anything. But, like, that's kind of what I do think. Like, I just think we should, you know, I'm, I'm very much, like, live in harmony, like, if you're doing your thing, you're doing your thing. I know it's bigger than that, isn't it? Like the politics and all that and stuff and, you know, trade and all the stuff and laws that go down with it. But at the end of the day, why would you hurt someone? Like, if you really believe in something, you should talk about it. You know, that's that's how I've always thought. And it's, it was people people like him, people like his attitude and stuff is the people that keep that sort of mentality going. And it's it's terrible. Um, but they're the only two times. And it was squashed quite quickly. And I don't think they were, like, fully committed to it neither. Um yeah, it's um, yeah, it's really, really, really a lovely place. Apart from that, don't let that them two last things like spoil it for you. Um, just go, like yeah, you, you don't have to have family there. Uh, I re- I highly recommend the Titanic Museum in Belfast, uh, the the Ulster the Ulster Folk Museum and the Transport Museum. Um. Go into Stormont, which I've never done, but I believe it's really good. When we got married over there, people raved about it. It's something I've still never done in all my time. And just have a look around Belfast. You know, travel out with, you know, do the Causeway Coast. If you're a fan of Game of Thrones, it was all filmed around Northern Ireland, and uh, you'll you'll they, they do Game of Thrones tours. Um, and yeah, just just go and feel the love of Northern Ireland and the and and the fresh air and the the very extreme changeable weather. Um, that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, I think I've ranted on and, and and prattled on for far too long uh thank you very much for listening and uh, i'll speak to you soon you've been listening to Stephen speak the podcast thanks for listening to my unscripted prattle on everything and nothing 
visit stevenspeak.com for updates, information, and my blog. You can follow more updates on social media at stevenspeakpc. Thanks very much, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you.